He's been good. Tell you a story. He's been good. The Lord. All of my life. Let me tell you a story. He's been good. The Lord. I'm going to say that one more time. All of my life. Let me tell you a story. He's been good. My life. All of my life. Let me tell you the story. Let me tell you the story. He's been good. He's been good. The Lord. The Lord's been mighty. Come on, Lawanda. I gotta testify what God has done for me. I'm not the same person. I'm not the way I used to be. He cleaned me up. He gave me another chance. He's been good. He's been good. My Lord My has. Good. I remember when yeah. the day I found my Lord. Let me tell you what happened, y'all. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. He filled me with the Holy Ghost. For the rest of my days, I'm going to get God the praise. Yeah. He's Good. He's been good. The Lord the has Lord good. Mm, for the rest of my days. I'm gonna give him the glory. He's been good. The Lord. For the rest of my days. I'm gonna give him the glory. He's been good. He's been good. He's been good. He's been good. He woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. He gave me the activities of my limbs. Living water down in my soul. Ever since the Holy Ghost came and took control. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's the living water down in my soul. Ever since the Holy Ghost came and took control, I gotta tell it. I gotta tell it. Oh, he woke me up this morning. He started me on my way. Gave me the activities on my limb. Gave me food and shelter. Clothes on my back. Mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. I walk on my way. Out of, out of, out of no way. When I was sick, I thought I wouldn't get well. Mm -hmm, I can tell. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's the living water down in my soul. Ever since the Holy Ghost came and took control. I, I, I gotta tell it. I, I, I gotta tell it. How he woke me up this morning. He started us on our way. He gave us activities of a limb. He gave us food and shelter. Clothes on your back. He's mighty, 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 mighty good. He's mighty, mighty, mighty good. He's mighty, mighty, mighty good. 
righteous you are. And righteous you be. Yeah, 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 yeah. I call you faithful. I call you faithful. Your name is faithful.
that you are.
collectively when we collectively come together and trying to shut out all the noises and the distractions in your mind and the enemy will do that and music helps to lift our thinking and our spirits above the outside problems and uh, the different um, weights that we bring with us when we come to a worship moment I want to well, I guess I don't see them now. The young people, they went to the children's church. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's what I, because I had wanted to ask them something. But anyway, next Sunday, uh, they are going to lead us in a grand worship service. So when you get home, you call up a member. Tell them don't miss next Sunday. Amen? Amen. Turn in your Bible to... The Gospel of John that we have been in for several Sundays, chapter 2, and the first 11 verses. John, which is one of the uh, Gospel writers, and uh, in theological terms, he's not a part of the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are part of the Synoptic uh, uh, focus. But John looks at Jesus and his ministry from a different perspective. Second chapter, verse, beginning at verse 1 and concluding at verse 11. Now I'm going to be reading from the NIV. On the third day, a, wa a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, 
the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Then John concludes that miracle that he recorded by saying this, the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. So in it, the reading of God's word, you may be seated. In the uh, King James Version, the end of verse 10, where the, um, uh, where the master of the banquet said that you have saved the best till now. In the King James, I think it is worded that you have saved the best for the last. I want us to look at and to let us study in this brief discussion this morning, light in a dark world, light in a dark world. It is not only obvious, but it is a fact. And this fact does not have to be based on statistics. That the church, not a building, but the body of Christ, is slowly and imperceptibly slipping from its origin of power. Now, in order to understand uh, this miracle, how many of you have read the third chapter of John where Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus? Good. And you know in that third chapter, Jesus, he definitively, in detail, he describes to Nicodemus what the kingdom is, why the kingdom is, and what his purpose is and was on earth. And uh, we'll get into that, that discussion uh, later. But what Jesus details for Nicodemus in chapter 3, he demonstrates this in chapter 2 in the miracle of the wedding at Cana. Amen? Let me say it another way. What he shows in chapter 2 in terms of the wedding, what he did, he explains it to Nicodemus in chapter 3. Is that clear? Okay, now, in his conversation with Nicodemus, the objective of that conversation was this, that we might have life through his name. That we, and that we is all-encompassing, everybody that mankind might have light through his name. The word life is the most pronounced keynote theme of John's gospel. Matthew, if you read it, teaches about righteousness. Mark teaches about service. And Luke teaches about mercy. But John 
goes to the very source of righteousness in his transcription, and also he goes to the depth of the spring of service. John tells us that Christ is the source of life, and Christ is himself life. Life is not a thing, John wants us to understand. But life is God's heart, is God's throb beat that beats in those that believe in Jesus Christ. Now in chapter 1 of his gospel, verse 3 and 4, John tells us in terms of natural life, even natural life comes to Christ. For he says that, through Jesus Christ, all things were made, and there was not anything made that was made without his sovereignty. So he is, he is behind the universe. What we see, what we smell, what we hear, this is God's creation. Amen? Now John has already, in chapter 1, established the deity of Jesus Christ. And he tells us that he has come to bring the world the life of a new creation. And this creation takes the place of the old life which has failed through man's sin and man's fall. Now just briefly I want you to permit me to direct our attention to the wedding in Cana of Galilee and how we are going to intertwine chapter 2 and 3. The miracle in chapter 2 points to Jesus' words that he gives to Nicodemus in the third chapter. You know the story. We just read it. Now let's examine the figures in this miracle and see how they point to the message and the mission of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The first wine in the miracle that ran out represents our natural life and the failure of the wine before the feast was ended. It recognizes our natural life and the failure of the wine before the feast had concluded. For an example, your life and my life is stacked with failure after failure, mistake after mistake, heartache after heartache, sorrow after sorrow, loss of happiness after loss of happiness. And all this comes about because of sin. Even our physical existence is limited to time because of sin. Life in this dimension runs out. And many of our achievements, many of our goals that we uh, plan to reach, because of time, we don't meet those goals. We don't meet those achievements. So therefore, like it is in the miracle, the cry goes forth, there is no wine. Or let's say it another way, there is not enough time for me to accomplish in terms of what I have proposed to do. This is for every one of us in our personal experiences. We never accomplish everything that we set out to do. Amen? You can have plans, and there's nothing wrong with having plans. But in the end, it's up to God, past time, in terms of whether he's going to permit us to live out or to see those goals and those achievements in our lives. If we are blessed to see one goal, Indeed, we are truly blessed. If we are blessed to achieve one thing, that is a blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. 
For there are many people that time does not give them that privilege or that opportunity. For, for an example, you take young people, babies that die before they are able to live a life. And they are not able to realize in terms of in this existence, in terms of what God's plan is for them. Life runs out. The joys of youth and the affection of youth eventually fade away. And nature has no remedy, no cure, no answer for this problem. And it is at this moment that the new wine of Jesus' love is revealed. And you notice in verse 11, it says that Jesus' glory was revealed, and because his glory was revealed, which means that the disciples especially saw the divinity of Christ. The man was there, but they realized that he was God in person, and that in terms of what he said, Indeed, he was, he, he had the power, he had the wisdom of God, and he was able to execute that. The new wine that Jesus brought to that uh, uh, wedding feast was not a product of the grapes that man grows here on earth. Amen? Earth cannot produce this type of wine. This, kind, this type of wine is a supernatural wine. And only the Holy Spirit can produce this type of wine. And the Holy Spirit does it through the pure water of regeneration that is poured into my heart, poured into your heart, poured into us as vessels. This wine that Jesus brings through his grace is richer, sweeter, purer, than all of the pleasures you will find here on earth. This wine of Jesus' grace is great, it's awesome, that even the world remarks and says, you have saved the best for last. Now this miracle is a miracle of Christ's teaching and of the gospel of his grace. As you know, or if you don't know, wine in the, New, in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, is an emblem of life. Wine represents joy. It represents jubilation. It represents celebration. And when you take the wine and you blend it with the symbol of the marriage feast, that was going on, which symbolizes the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, combining that grace with that joy, what do you have? You have a life that is full, a life that is filled with the joy of Jesus Christ. Let me say it another way. Without Jesus Christ, you can try to find happiness in this existence. You can try to find joy, but that joy and happiness without Christ is going to be what? Temporary? Short-lived? You're going to hit a, road, you're going to hit a roadblock? It is not going to measure up to your standards. Let me give another example. Let me break it down a little bit further. Two people come together in what is called marriage, and they make a decision that they are going to what? Live with one another until death do them part. When they come together, if they're young, there's joy, there's jubilation, they are happy. And what do they say to one another? I love you. In fact, that's what, that's what this day is all about, right? Amen? It's the cold getting all of y'all's vocal cords. Is everybody frozen here this morning? All right, then. And when they come together, 
They are so what? Happy. If you notice that when you come to a uh, wedding and the bride, she comes down the aisle and she's smiling and everybody's taking pictures and the family on both sides, they are laughing and everybody is so happy. You go to the repast and it is nothing but just what? It, 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 it is an event of joy. And people are eating and drinking, not the type of wine that they drank then, but anyway, they're drinking. But now give them maybe about five or ten years and then see if that same joy, that same love that they express to one another is still as relevant as it was when they came together. You know, don't, 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 don't observe it then, but let time wear on it. And if Christ is not in it, believe me when I tell you, the joy is going to go. And uh, it might end up, I think, uh, one, of the, uh, um, one of the Motown singers said, hit the road, Jack. And don't you come back no more. I don't remember who, who said that or who's saying it, whatever the case is. But the marriage falls apart. And it falls apart simply because the couple is depending upon physical things. They're depending upon what they see, what they have planned here in this time zone, in this earth, which is short. Because Job says in 14.1, man that is born of woman, what? Is of a few days. And then scripture tells us, even though we might think if a person lives to be 80 or 90, for us, that's a long time. But in the sight of God, uh, that's not even maybe a day, maybe a couple of hours, a couple of seconds. I don't know. So joy here is not really permanent, pure joy. The type of love that man is looking for, he's looking for pleasurable love. Love that you can feel through the senses. Jesus Christ didn't bring that kind of love. He brought a love that transcends above the physical. He brought a love that when in that marriage union, when, how can I say it? And I, 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 don't, I don't want to cast uh, too much of a negative shade over it. But when that marriage reaches a point where the joy has deteriorated, where the love has reached a point that the two people... I'm not saying in the morning, baby, how you feel. I still love you. You're still looking as good as you did when we first got married. Now the two get up in the morning, don't even speak to one another. Go their separate ways. And one has to ask the other, do you still love me? Does that sound familiar to anybody here this morning? Or what I'm saying, is it hitting you, stabbing you so hard? Until the pain, you can't say nothing? Is that it? You cannot keep a marriage. Two people cannot maintain their love and joy for one another from a human perspective. It has to be by the grace of God. Because believe me, young folk, when I tell you, no matter how much you are in love uh, at the beginning, if it's just that, it ain't going to last. God has got to be in the midst of that. He is the one that you're going to have to go to from the standpoint of realizing that when you don't feel loved, or you don't feel like loving when you are riding the plane of your emotions, then God helps you to realize 
that his eternal love is not based on human feelings, not based on emotion, but it is based on the grace of God, the power of God, the sustaining joy of God. And that's what Jesus demonstrated in that wedding at, Can at Cana of Galilee. He showed them, even though they didn't understand, he showed them that the new wine that he was bringing, the new kingdom, the new life, the new creation, is better than what you have experienced, what you have gone through, what you think you know. And that new life, that new creation, that he spells out in chapter 3 to Nicodemus and lets him know that he must be born again. And Nicodemus tells, well, Nicodemus is thinking again from a human perspective. You mean to tell me a grown man weighing about 180, maybe 200 pounds, maybe over six feet? How in the world can I get back in my mother's room? And Jesus tells him, I'm not talking about a physical birth. I'm talking about a different type of birth that's not from here, but it's from there coming now. You must what? Go into a spiritual transformation. And Jesus is the only one that can bring this transformation in your life. This parable represents the fullness of life, God's grace in the plan of redemption. Jesus said, I have come that they might have what? Life. But not only life. He wasn't talking about just human existence, living a long time. But I have come to bring them eternal existence. And that this life is abundant. It's more than they can even ask or even imagine. That's what Jesus does in the life of a believer. We are living in a time where the name of Jesus, if you utter that name, you might get in trouble. We are living in some, some harrowing times, some frightening days that even persons who had proclaimed their salvation are afraid to even live it out because they're afraid that they may be criticized and ostracized and they don't want that to happen. They would much rather please men than to please God. And that's sad. Because in the end, men can't save you. Men can't help you. Men cannot stop you from dying. Men cannot come to your aid when your heart is sagging and when you've done all that you can and there's nothing else that you can do. And when you come to the end of your rope, and your hope has just about reached the point that it's almost dead. Your faith is crumbling. What do you do? Well, you can call on some friends, and nothing wrong with that. But your friends can only share with you their experience. But that's not necessarily going to give you the insight that you need. That's not going to give you the encouragement and the power that you need for your journey. That's not going to pick you up. That's not going to, that's not going to re-energize your hope. That's not going to give more strength to your faith. You got to find that well spring of joy and happiness. You got to go to Jesus Christ to get it. Your partner can't give it to you. Your spouse can't give it to you because they need it themselves. Let me go a little bit further. Even a church member can't give it to you because they are battling their demons. And since all of us are battling demons, 
then where do we go? What source do we go to? Jesus. And that's the reason why the songwriter said, what a friend we have in Jesus. All, not, not, not just some things, but everything. All our sins and griefs, heartbreak, sadness to bear. What a privilege. It's an honor to carry some things, two-thirds of a thing, three-fifths of a thing, everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and, and, and temptations? Are we troubled uh, anywhere? We should not be what? Discouraged, but take it to the Lord in prayer. I am finding out from my own, through my own personal experience, God is showing me in terms of a different entrance into his being, his glory, and his power. I am seeing God differently now in my life. I'm understanding his plan for me differently than I did maybe even 10 years ago. There are some things when you are young, you just don't have the experience, you don't have the wisdom, you don't have the insight. And if you are blessed by God to live a little bit longer, he will, if you stay with him, if you constantly stay in prayer with him, if you are there in terms of reading his word, staying in meditation and calling on him, he will, as the time goes along, he will open up the windows of heaven. He says in Malachi, he says that if you put me first and honor me, what will I do? I will open up what the windows of heaven. Now we know heaven doesn't have literal windows, right? What he's talking about, I will bless you abundantly so much until it will stagger your little mind. And let me say it another way. It will almost destroy your thinking. For in Ephesians, the second, the third chapter, it says that he is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or even imagine according to his work in us to the glory of the church, Jesus Christ. We are living in a day that the church seems to be in a spiritual coma. And folk are just attending, but they're not growing. They are coming for entertainment. They are coming in order to hear what they want to hear, to make them feel good, to give them false hopes prefabricated direction and when it falls apart they're right back where they started in fact they're in worse shape than when they started Jesus is our God he is our provision in fact I'm thinking about that sheet um, that uh, uh, that was put out in the class by sister Humphrey and that sheet says all of God's provisions are under his plan of provision. And it was like an umbrella. And that God, what, will take care of you. How many of you literally, I don't mean figuratively, I don't mean in terms of what somebody told you or what you think, but how many of you here this morning know literally that Jesus Christ is a provider. How many of you know that? And how many of you have seen him provide and work miracles in your life? And nobody, you, you don't need to go to Webster's Dictionary to find your definition, right? You don't need in terms of a buffeting support from another person. You know beyond a shadow of a doubt what God has done in your life. And that's what walking with the Lord is all about. You got to.
to know, you got to know, you got to know, you got to know, you got to know what God is to you and what he can do for you and in you and through you. And you cannot guess. And that's the reason why many times he allows, he allows pain and suffering into our lives. Are you aware of the fact that suffering can open your eyes much greater than pleasure? Are any of y'all aware of that? It's just like a child, and I'm through. Well, I said I was through, but I'm concluding with this last remark. You take a child, and every time they want a toy or they want their way, you let them have their way. You buy them a new toy. What normally do they do with that new toy? They'll play with it, but after they get used to it and tired of it, what happens to the toy? They either throw it away or put it in the toy box where the other broken toys are. Now, let another child come over to the house, whether it's in the family, cousins, or somebody else, and that other child wants to play with those discarded toys. How does that child act? Now, they possibly hadn't played with that toy for Lord knows how long. And they're tired of it. But if somebody else gets their toy, they get jealous. And they go to them and they snatch it away from them and say, that's my toy. I don't want you to play with it or just wait. I'll let you know when you can play with it. That's human nature. Sin makes us selfish, indifferent. But Jesus gives us a different spirit, a spirit of sacrifice, a spirit of, okay, you're the preference. You go first. I'm not going to argue with that. I don't need to argue with it because just like God is blessing you, he's got a blessing for me. Heaven never, and the Holy Spirit just told me this, John, heaven never runs out of blessings. Never. And heaven has got some blessings that will, my, it will be mind-boggling. Life in a dark world. The old wine ran out, didn't it? Jesus brought new wine. And the wine master said, you have really surprised us. Usually you bring the most valuable wine first. And when the, when the guest gets drunk, then you bring the cheaper wine. But you reversed it. You brought the cheap wine. Now you're bringing what? The most valuable wine. And notice again, verse 11, where it says, when Jesus performed this miracle, turned water into wine, and you notice he didn't touch the jars. He didn't go over and taste the water himself. But he just, in fact, he didn't even speak. There's no indication in John's transcript that Jesus spoke a word to turn the water into wine. He just told the servants what? Fill up the empty jars with water and then take some water out, carry it to the man. Which meant that as the water was going into the jars, the power of God was transforming the water into sweet wine. 